which in fact brings me to our wonderful guest speakers. Um, so first, we're going to be joined by Lisa Debitz and Chrissy Nichols, nutrition consultants for the uh, Child and Adult Care Food Program. Uh, Lisa is actually also CACFP's liaison at ELV, so uh, she helps us keep all of our ducks in a row for the food program in core. Uh, today, she and Chrissy will talk about what you need to know in this shifting landscape around CACFP. Then, after their presentation, we'll spend a few minutes asking audience questions before transitioning over to Erin Kendrick. Uh, she's the Outreach and Partnerships Coordinator for the WIC program. As there may be some less familiarity with WIC compared to the food program, she'll focus on the basics of WIC before transitioning into how it relates to childcare until uh, finally we just uh, ask a couple questions. Oh, and uh, finally, if you haven't requested free access to ELV's resource platform, we'll be sending out a link to do so in the post-webinar messaging as well. Uh, that should come out about an hour after this presentation ends. Okay, uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll be handing it off to Lisa and Chrissy to take it away. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, Chrissy is sharing her screen right now so that we have our slides up. Um, so as Michael said, my name is Lisa. Um, Chrissy and I will just give a little bit more of an introduction um, to get started. So um, I have been with the Child and Adult Care Food Program in the Denver office for about two years now. Uh, and I have recently also taken on the role as the CACFP technology subject matter expert. So um, as those of you that are already participating in the program know, we just this week have merged our old cheer system with the Department of Education's um, pub system to create a new child nutrition portal. Uh, so this is the new system for online application and reimbursement, and it is um, very exciting. It, it really should make things easier for both programs. If you're in both Department of Education and CACFP programs, um, it makes life a lot easier. It's all done in the same system now. So um, very exciting things going on with CACFP. Um, and I will go ahead and let um, Chrissy introduce herself now. Okay, so um, I'm Chrissy. I'm with Colorado CACFP team. I have been with CACFP for over three years, but only with um, this state agency since about September. Previously, I was with the CACFP state agency in Wisconsin. Um, mostly what I've been focusing on, especially recently, has been a lot with the USDA policy memos and waivers as they come out, as well as all the compliance doing reviews and technical assistance. So I'm really happy to be on this team in Colorado. Um, it's been really fun to see how they both both states work with um, this federal food program. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and go to slide two and go over our objectives for today. Um, so first, we just briefly want to review the CACFP basics uh, for anyone who may not already be participating. Um, and then we're going to discuss participation during COVID-19. Uh, we'll review the program waivers. Um, and talk about if you're currently open or plan to open soon. And then finally, share some great resources. And of course, there'll be time for questions at the end. Um, so starting off with the CACFP basics, um, our mission and goals. Um, so the CACFP's mission is to promote and support the health of Colorado's children and adults in care. Um, and CACFP serves nutritious meals and snacks to eligible care centers, daycare homes, adult daycare centers, and to children and youth who participate in after-school care programs um, or reside in emergency shelters. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide. And um, so USDA is the Food and Nutrition Service, USDA administers CACFP through grants to each state. In Colorado, the CACFP is administered by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, and it covers independent centers and sponsoring organizations that enter into agreements with our state agency um, to assume administrative and financial responsibility for CACFP operations. Um, and all approved institutions must meet nonprofit food service requirements. Um, so it is a reimbursement program to provide nutritious meals and snacks. 
And so the CACSP meal patterns uh, meet the USDA guidelines based on age, and they allow for a variety of foods. Um, so this includes the minimum portions and components. So the meal components that we have are fluid milk, meat, meat alternates, grains, vegetables, and fruits. And the quality and quantity of food are the most important factor. Um, we really stress this. This is really the heart of the program. Um, and this is so important because these children are typically in care for eight hours a day, five days a week, um, right? So they're getting two thirds of their daily calories and nutrients from the food choices that the centers provide to them. Um, so just an amazing responsibility um, and just so impressive with everything that's been going on with COVID-19, um, just how these centers have responded and taken over with genuine care, not just for their enrolled participants, but also those, those children's families. Um, everyone's just really stepped up. So we are just so, so proud and so happy to be a part of this amazing program. Um, and everybody going above and beyond during this difficult time. Uh, so that being said, um, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, so in order to participate on the CACFP, there are certain requirements that must be met, such as licensing, um, including staff to child ratios, health and safety standards, which might be like a health inspection um, required annually. We do have participation for for-profit and nonprofit centers. Um, and then the for-profit centers can be eligible for free and reduced reimbursement rates, but they still have to meet the nonprofit food service uh, for the CACFP reimbursement piece. Uh, everyone must follow the CACFP specific meal patterns um, that we just went over and keep all the required records for three years plus the current fiscal year. We have a lot of specific record keeping requirements for the program. Um, as you know, if you're already participating, but we will not get into that today. Um, we just wanted to kind of do a little bit of an overview. Um, and please feel free to reach out to Chrissy and I afterwards. Our emails are on the last slide if um, you're not participating and you are interested. Um, and I will go ahead and hand it off to Chrissy at this time to start reviewing the COVID-19 information. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about participating on CACFP during COVID-19 and if you're not, how, how you can get started. So um, if you are a center that's looking to participate, um, you have a couple options. You can either connect and enroll through a CACFP sponsor, which means they take care of some of the administrative portions of your um, uh, food program pieces, and then one thing I want to point out, if programs decide to participate uh, under a sponsor, the sponsors can retain up to 15% of reimbursement just to cover the cost for supporting you, doing that administrative work that you don't have to do necessarily. Um, another really great way to participate is to just have um, an application just with us through CDPHE. And you can do this by calling or emailing our office directly and wanting to get started that way. So there are definitely options. Um, to get going on our program. And we definitely encourage those who are interested in getting going right away with us to fill out the intake form, which will have a link on these slides that you have access to. Um, um, we've revised it and made it more simple, especially during this time. We know everyone's kind of running in a million directions. So that is one thing that we are happy to have simplified during this. So any phone inquiries can go to the phone number on this slide or emails if that's easier to just connect that way. So I wanna talk a little bit about program waivers and what flexibilities are, offer, are being offered right now to our centers and homes. So USDA has released some nationwide waivers that Colorado has elected to participate in. Um, I don't know, if all states have chosen to participate in all of them, but that is one thing that is really nice um, of Colorado to offer all these flexibilities to our states. So I'm going to try and open up this um, link here. I think it's working. So all of the waivers we have summarized in this at a glance document. Um, it provides links right to the direct policy memo from USDA. It says how long they're in effect for and then um, if programs choose to participate after they're on our program, um, we have a Google form for them to fill out so we can track it and report that data to um, USDA. 
So waiver number one is a meal service time flexibility waiver. And this one just helps with removing the requirements about how long meal services need to last for, the time between meal services and that fun stuff. So that is one that is pretty straightforward in um, what it means. And we have had a good number of, part of programs participate in that one. Uh, waiver number two is non-congregate feeding, and this is a very popular one. So typically meals and snacks have to be eaten on site, um, or at least in a group setting, like on a field trip kind of thing. Um, but this waiver removes that requirement, um, especially with helping to promote social distancing. And um, by doing that, there's less interaction with each other, so you don't have um, as much of a chance of getting COVID-19. So this method allows things like grab and go, drive through, and even delivery of meals to um, families for the enrolled participants of the child care center. So one thing with delivery I wanna point out is if you're opting into that, you do have to get written consent from the family, but it can be something as easy as an email. So that's a really nice part that it doesn't have to be a physical paper with um, you know, pen on it. So if you combine the non-congregate feeding with meal service time flexibility, you're able to provide multiple days worth of meals at a time. So I have a few programs who are doing Mondays and Tuesdays meals and one pickup on Monday. It just allows um, you know, families to pick up more meals at one time and doesn't have such a burden of having to leave constantly to pick up meals. So that one we're really, really happy to have as an option for our programs. Waiver number three, is um, particularly only for the at-risk after-school program. So this removes the requirement to have an enrichment activity alongside with the meal service. So just removes it, um, helps them also be able to do the non-congregate feeding without having any activities. Waiver number four is one of our most popular ones. It's around our meal pattern flexibility. So Typically, we have a meal pattern, and in order for meals to be reimbursable, they have to follow the meal pattern. And if not, there's a chance that meals can be disallowed. So this removes that restriction, that, you know, that strict must be this and nothing else type of meal pattern. So we recognize that grocery stores, you know, are limiting how much you can get. Sometimes they're completely out of stock. Um, distributors are similar. Sometimes they're not able to deliver what you ordered. Um, so for example, we've had a lot of programs telling us that they can only get one to two gallons of milk at a time. And also they, um, the stores may not even have the right type of milk. So on CACFP, 2% milk is not allowed. And so this would remove that restriction. Um, and in saying that maybe they don't have any 1% milk, in stock, but they can give you 2% milk. So this just allows that flexibility around the meal pattern. But of course, we expect programs to make their best effort to meet the meal pattern since this is a food program and we're focusing on feeding our children healthy food. Um, what's interesting with this waiver is that it right now is only in effect until May 31st. It, it pre previously was only in effect until April 30th, USDA is um, extending any and all of these waivers in small increments um, just because they are mostly wanting to make sure that programs are following the guidelines as much as they can um, during this very odd time. So this could get extended again. We have no idea what they're planning on doing. Um, this waiver number four for meal pattern flexibility is one that we have to approve. So people must fill out our Google form and then they have to receive the approval letter from us via email. So that is one key part with the meal pattern flexibility if you're in the state of Colorado. Waiver number five is a great one to go with the non-congregate feeding waiver because it allows parents or guardians to pick up meals for the CACFP participant. So um, typically, children have to be present in order for families to pick up meals. This one removes that. Parents can step by without dragging the whole family along um, and they can pick up the meals. So that one's a really nice one. Waiver number seven is monitoring flexibility for sponsors of centers. This means you have more than two, two or more sites um, participating under one application with us. And this is a um, a great opportunity to have the flexibility around the monitoring visits that are required, normally three per year, but now only two. Um, we recognize it's not necessarily safe to be in centers and homes at this time, 
um, just because anything we can do to stay home and not be out and about with the ability to spread um, COVID-19, we're happy that we have this flexibility. So there's more in detail, but it just only really applies to the sponsors. Waiver number eight is monitoring flexibility for state agencies. So that's Lisa and myself at CDPHE. This allows us to do pre-approval visits to get programs on um, by doing desk audits where we don't have to come on site and as well as doing our reviews that are normally due every two or three years, depending on how large they are um, as desk audits instead. So we, we appreciate that one. So we don't have to put ourselves and others at risk when we're out and about. Waiver number 12 is an extension for January and February 2020 um, claims that are submitted for reimbursement. So normally there's only 60 days for the deadline to submit claims. They added an additional 30 days on top. Um, we haven't heard anything about any extensions for any other months. These were just for January and February. And our final waiver is the state agency annual review flexibility. So Normally we have a certain percent of reviews we have to do annually. This gives us that flexibility to not necessarily meet those standards if things persist and we can um, have that flexibility, which we are very appreciative of. So next we I want to talk a little bit about any programs that are currently open or plan to open soon. Um, in Colorado, we have a safer at home, which is phase two guidance. Um, You'll have access to this link to read through. There's a lot of you know, in interesting information on here. What it's really talking about is the importance of hand washing right away when children come into the center and your workers and sanitizing throughout the day as well. Um, and staggering mealtimes. They do have some programs where they um, have all the children come to like a large kitchen cafeteria type area. Um, and instead of having everyone come at once, stagger the mealtime so there's fewer children at a time within there. So this just really offers um, some really great information on what this phase two looks like in Colorado and um, really what is kind of expected to keep everyone safe at this time. One thing I wanna talk about is a question we get very often during this um, COVID-19 is, should we be doing family style dining right now? We typically highly recommend it and want to see it. It just has a lot of benefits to you know, the hand-eye coordination, social skills with passing the food along around the table with their peers, um, and even really honing in on those hunger cues. So normally we're all for it. Right now, we don't encourage family style dining during COVID-19. It's just not something that is worth the risk right now. Um, if there's any Head Start programs watching this, I would highly suggest you check with your own program requirements um, around the family style dining. USDA just recently put out this really great resource around um, the food safety and best practices around the parent pickup of meals and snacks. So some things I want to point out down here um, are really encouraging staff, especially food service staff, to not um, come to work if they are sick. It's just definitely one of those things that when you're working with food, and this is a general food safety thing, that we really don't want them to be working with the food when they're sick because in centers and even homes, there's just a high chance of spreading any illness to everyone within the center. So that's just a really nice recent resource from USDA that we wanted to share with everyone. Um, this is just a resource list for people who are interested in learning more about CACFP or if they're in Colorado going to our website. Um, we also have uh, the Colorado Emergency Child Care Collaborative um, link on here. There's just a lot of really great work going around that for emergency um, child care. We also have a link to the nationwide waivers, as well as that document I pulled up before the at a glance, where it's that summary of all of our um, waivers that we've participated in Colorado and information about them at a quick glance. We also have a frequently asked question during COVID-19. It really talks a lot about the different um, nationwide waivers and just questions that come up around them. So I'm happy that we have these resources for you all to check out. And with that, we can take any questions at this time. Yeah, thank you both, Christy and Lisa. Um, so everybody that might have questions, please feel free to keep sending them in. Um, so the first one I have uh, for you both is actually um, 
concerning the piece you were talking about, about the USDA extension. Um, could, I'm sorry, I had uh, the squirrels came back again during that part, so I actually missed it and was hoping that you could uh, share, like, what happens as we approach the 31st and that flexibility period is supposed to wane? Right. So right now, so most of them go through June 30th. The one that's ending May 31st is our one around the meal pattern flexibility. So as we approach that, if USDA decides to extend, we will push out that information as well as um, post and update all of our information on our website. When we get closer to that June 30th deadline, um, it'll kind of be the same thing. If they extend it, we'll be pushing out information. If not, then um, things are expected to go back to normal um, of all of those flexibilities, which may or may not be tough because every county and city is different from, you know, a different county and city, three, three counties over. So um, it's not a fabulous answer, but we are really hoping to see things improve with COVID-19 everywhere, hopefully as this time goes on, as well as if needed, these flexibilities should be extended by USDA. Awesome. Yeah, extending off that question, actually, uh, one just came in related to it. Um, if they're planning on open to reopen uh, on May 18th and may or may not need the meal pattern flexibility form, uh, should they still submit for it even if they end up not needing to use it? What I've been telling people is if, you know, if they're ones that have been in the grocery store and they kind of have, you know, an idea of what's been available, what's not been available, if they feel that they're going to be totally fine, they don't need to complete it. If they're worried about milk or whole grains or, um, you know, just cereals meeting the sugar limits, that kind of thing, I would suggest filling it out. Um, within it, we have options to click which type, which um, components of the meal pattern people might want uh, that might have concerns about. So, you know, if, if they're getting that feeling that what's in their local grocery stores or from in any conversations with distributors, if they're not getting certain things that they're in the right quantities, then I would say fill it out. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, also, I was curious, is there going to be any kind of difference in how people uh, report their food program report, or is all of that saying roughly the same? Right. So right now, everything is still the same. You will log into our new portal now and submit everything the same way you would do with Cheers. So um, if you are a family daycare home participating under a sponsor, it should be the same as how you have been submitting your claim information that way. Um, you know, if anything were to change, we'll definitely be pushing that information out. But right now, everything is still the same, just now with a different um, system that we had before. Lisa, do you have anything to add on the new system? Um, no, I was just going to say that perhaps if they are choosing the non-congregate waiver and they're doing delivery, um, that's kind of more around for the ROMs, just checking off. Uh, it, it's going to look a little bit different than it would if the children were in care um, and you were marking off the ROMs at each meal, obviously. So you're going to be having your own system for your center of checking off who did you deliver a meal to um, or, yes. yeah, that kind of thing. Awesome. Thank you. And then um, just because, you know, I, people are always curious. Yes, we will be sending out, uh, for the people on the phone, we will be sending out um, all of the resources, the slides, and a recording of this presentation. Uh, out about an hour after uh, th this webinar closes. Um, but I know that there's always a little bit of complexities um, in any kind of situation. So there's a lot of information in those links, but if for some reason it doesn't fall into that, where would you recommend people go with questions? Um, so if they are not participating on the CACFP, they can call our main line, which the phone number is on this slide. Otherwise, if you are, feel free to reach out to Lisa or I. We have our emails on here. Um, even sometimes after you watch a presentation or listen to it, you're like, oh, I have a question that I didn't have during. So feel free at any point to reach out to us. Um, that's probably the best way to get any questions or any specific links to other things too. Yeah, and actually, you know, <laughs> there's a great uh, more specific question that just popped in. If uh, if they're thinking about doing a split day to help with social, social distancing, are we able to serve lunch twice in a day? 
Mm -hmm. That would kind of go with the mealtime waiver, right, Chrissy? Yeah, so um, that allows for flexibility to kind of have an extended meal time or two separate meal times like that. Um, and that's essentially shift care at that point. So if there's a section in the morning, section in the afternoon of children participating, um, that's okay to do it like that. I would try to serve the same meal like components to both just to keep it consistent so that they don't tell their friends like I had broccoli today and they're like, we didn't have broccoli, we had carrots. So um, just little things like that to try and keep it consistent between the two groups. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for all of these resources and for uh, sitting with us here today. Um, for those of you that um, are not familiar with WIC, we are going to be transitioning over to WIC so that uh, Aaron Kendrick will be able to uh, speak on that subject. So um, Aaron, and if you wouldn't mind, just wait one second. Thank you both Lisa and Chrissy. And um, if anybody does have questions, there's their contact details. All right, thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. All right, how does that look? Beautiful. Is it up? Okay, gorgeous, thanks guys. Um, let me move that over there. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Erin Kendrick, and I'm the Outreach and Partnerships Coordinator for the Colorado WIC program. And I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day, especially on this beautiful spring Friday, to learn more about how CACFP and WIC can help support the families that you all serve. So just wanted to say thank you for joining us. And I know, as Michael stated, some of you may not be familiar with WIC and others of you may be. So today I'm going to spend a little bit of time just providing an overview about the WIC program and discussing uh, who's eligible to participate, a little bit about the WIC foods, um, letting you know what's new in the program over the past few years, because things have, of course, changed for the better and then um, uh, addressing any program changes that are taking place right now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And then also how you all can help connect families to WIC. Okay, so, let me move that over there. <clears throat> uh, so WIC is, oh, I wanna move that there, sorry guys. That presenter view keeps popping up. Um, so WIC is the nutrition program for pregnant women, new moms, so that's breastfeeding moms up to the first year of the baby's life, um, and then non-breastfeeding moms up to the first six months. And of course, we serve infants and children under the age of five. And an interesting fact is that WIC actually serves um, over half of all babies born in the U.S., so that's a significant amount of children that we serve, which is really cool. Our goal is to help keep moms, infants, and children healthy through critical times of growth and development, and also help improve the long-term health outcomes for these individuals, and then improve food security for families. And WIC does that through four core services. The first one being um, healthy food that is provided for free, uh, nutrition information and education for the families, breastfeeding support, and this could also include the use of breast pumps, uh, for moms, and then referrals to healthcare and other services and resources such as childcare. And then, of course, WIC is free. And um, another thing in, important to note is that uh, proof of citizenship and proof of pregnancy is not required. So, I'll talk a little bit about eligibility. So, in order to be eligible for WIC, applicants must meet three um, or criteria in three areas. The first area is category, the second is income, and the third is residency. So they must be a resident of Colorado in order to participate in Colorado WIC. Um, so again, the category is who we serve. And what that means is who is getting direct services. So that's a WIC food package. That could be a breast pump, that is height and weight checks and um, iron screening. So that's what is considered a drug service. So the individuals that receive that are pregnant women, of course, and breastfeeding moms up to the first year, and then postpartum women up to the first six months if they're not breastfeeding of the baby's life, and then um, children up to their fifth birthday and infants. 
So you'll keep hearing me repeat those categories, but um, those are the individuals we actually serve. But with that said, WIC is for all families. And, and what I mean by that is that anybody who is a caregiver or a guardian of a child under five may apply for WIC for their child and receive benefits for their child. So that's um, fathers, grandparents who are caring for their children full time. It could be a foster parent. Um, so all sorts of um, different types of family makeups. Um, and I think a lot of times fathers and grandparents, if they have custody of the children, don't think that they actually can qualify uh, just because of the name of the program, Women, Infants, and Children. So we just really want to make that clear. Anybody who's caregiving can apply for their child. Um, in terms of income eligibility, there's actually two ways to qualify. One is through adjunctive eligibility, and the other way is um, through household income. So it's either or, and I'll explain that a little bit more now. Um, if you're not familiar with what, a, sorry, adjunctive eligibility means, it's kind of a mouthful, is that if somebody is participating in Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, or the food distribution program on Indian reservations, then WIC can actually use, um, um, WIC can verify that they're currently participating in one of those programs and use that to income qualify them. And this is really helpful in streamlining our process. So uh, applicants aren't running around trying to find pay stubs for the last 30 days and all that, because that can be challenging. So as long as staff can verify that they're currently participating in one of these programs, at a certification or recertification appointment, that um, that's all we need. And if they're not participating in one of these programs, then we do look at the household income, and that is the gross income. Um, and that must fall below 185%, or sorry, at or below 185% of the federal poverty level. Um, and those income guidelines are updated every year on July 1st. But this is just a snapshot of um, what a family of four would need to make in order to qualify for WIC. So um, about $917 per week, making less than that would qualify them. And that's a little bit less than $4,000 a month. I think I did the math correctly. I think it was $3,600 a month. Um, so that's something important to know. I think a lot of people think they don't qualify for WIC, but WIC takes, um, I, I would say like a low to a me medium income level. So a lot of people actually do qualify. Um, and then also a, a pregnant woman can be counted as two um, if she's pregnant with twins. And we also would count her as three if she's pregnant with triplets. Um, and so, or yeah, no, I'm sorry. If she's pregnant with one, she can be counted as two towards the household she's pregnant with twins, she could be counted as three. And so of course that would help with um, meeting the income cutoff as well. And if someone has absolutely no income, we actually have a procedure for that as well to ensure they can qualify. Um, and then in terms of residency, the applicants must live in Colorado and provide proof of address. However, if they are homeless and they don't have proof um, of course, they wouldn't at that point. We do have a procedure to ensure they can also receive benefits as well. And again, I want to make it um, clear that WIC does not ask for or keep information about visa status or citizenship. So that's important again to know. And then this is just a little snapshot of Colorado and where WIC clinics are located. And we have over 100 clinics throughout the state. We serve every county. So even if there's not an actual clinic in the county, we do have local WIC agencies that um, serve that area. Um, and we have a clinic finder on our website. So you can just type in the zip code and then find the closest clinic to you or to the family. And then this is just a little bit about the Colorado WIC foods that we provide um, that are approved. And so the foods that WIC provides are designed to supplement the client's diets uh, with specific nutrients. So we're, we are providing foods, again, just to supplement the diet, not to be the entire diet. Um, 
so that's why WIC and SNAP pair nicely together because it can really help the client, you know, buy their WIC essentials and then use SNAP um, if they participate to buy the additional foods they need. Um, and then WIC foods include, this is just a, a basic list, but um, infant cereal, baby foods, whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, so money to purchase those, eggs, milk, um, iron fortified cereal for adults, peanut butter and beans. We of course all offer the option of soy milk if someone doesn't drink regular milk um, and tofu and trying to support different diets and meet everybody's needs. This is a hyperlink to our food list, which is super long, so I didn't want to pull that up today, but it is also available in six languages and it's downloadable on our website. So I was gonna talk a little bit about what's new with WIC over the last few years. Um, we moved from WIC checks to the eWIC card, which is an EBT card, so uh, electronic benefit card, uh, similar to what SNAP uses, but not the same card, a different card, because it's a separate program. And then that has made shopping at the store a lot easier because people don't have to buy all their foods at one time, they can buy them throughout the month. And then we also have the WIC Shopper app, which has been a huge hit with all our participants because they can be at the store and not sure um, if something is WIC approved or not. And instead of flipping through the allowable pamphlet, they can actually just scan the item to find out if it's WIC approved. And that can really help reduce um, shopping issues at the store. And they can also check the app to see what benefits they have left for the month um, to make sure they have enough to redeem while they're at the store. And then we also introduce phone appointment options and online nutrition lessons um, for appointment flexibility. So while some of our appointments need to be done in person, so that's our enrollment and our re-enrollments and our mid-certs, um, every other appointment, so basically every three months, people do have an option to either come to the clinic, do an appointment by phone, or take an online nutrition lesson. We also have text reminders, so of course for appointments, but we also have text reminders for other things. So if they don't have any food benefits left, that means they need another appointment with WIC, and that just reminds the family to call WIC, schedule an appointment, so they can um, stay on the program. So that's just an example of one text reminder. And we have introduced an online referral form that families can fill out if they're interested in WIC and healthcare providers, childcare providers, and anybody else can actually fill out that form as well. Super short. And um, of course, if you're filling it out on behalf of the family, we want you, know, you to get verbal consent from the family that that's okay. And we also have a new website. So definitely more um, user friendly. So I was going to share a little bit about how WIC has changed during the COVID-19 outbreak, and it has changed so much. Um, we were really scrambling when COVID-19 hit because many, many of our um, appointments have to be done in person per federal regulations. But since most of our agencies are located within a public health um, department, that caused a lot of problems because they closed the doors. And of course, we want to keep our families and our staff safe. So in order to provide services solely by phone, uh, we had to submit waivers to USDA's uh, Food and Nutrition Services, so similar to what CACFP had to do. And we submitted a waiver that would allow us to provide all services by phone. And then um, it also allowed us to waive the heights and weight and hemoglobin checks that are required. Uh, at some of our appointments. And it also allowed us to mail the EWIC card. So normally you have to receive that in person and sign for it, but it allowed us to mail it. That has been super, super helpful. Um, and our clinics have done a wonderful job adjusting to this new um, way of doing business. Um, we also expanded our food list because as you know, due to panic shopping, there was a lot of problems at the store in terms of food availability. So in order to help ensure that our clients could find the foods that they need, we ended up being able to expand some of our milk option um, and then as well as some of our whole grains. But that is another big one. And then 
Another one is special infant formulas. So infant formulas that are not available typically in a grocery store. Um, if an infant is on some special formula that the doctor has ordered that WIT provides, we did work with Ward Road Pharmacy um, to have us to have them, I'm sorry, deliver formulas to clients' homes throughout the state. Normally clients have to come to the clinic once a month to pick up their monthly supply. So this was huge um, because many of our clinics were closed and staff were not working there either. So this really, really helped. Um, also, like CSCFP, these waivers do expire on May 31st. And obviously that's in a, just a couple of weeks. So we are submitting at the national level waiver extensions and hopefully those will go through and if we did get them approved we've asked through september um i don't know when they may be approved and if they are approved if it will be through that date but we were very hopeful because a lot of these services that we are currently providing um we need to message to our families and our partners in the community such as yourselves about how we are going back to normal, quote unquote. I don't know what that looks like, but, um, and give everybody enough time to um, adapt to that change as well. Make sure there's no confusion. So I want to include a little bit as well about how WIC's gonna be providing services in the coming weeks and months. And I did just touch on it a little bit. Um, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, they are going to be, oh different clinics throughout the state that will be opening their doors because their public health agency or health center that they're located in are opening their doors. There'll be other agencies that will remain close to the public, but still trying to provide services remotely. Um, again, all of this really piggy, piggybacks on those waivers. So if the waivers are extended, then it's okay if their doors are closed to the public because we know we can still provide those services remotely. Um, all I can really say about this is there's a lot of unknowns. It will vary throughout the state from WIC clinic to WIC clinic. We really, really, really recommend that families contact the clinic that they go to or are planning to go to um, to see how services are being provided currently. But please do know that services will continue to be provided, um, but it might look different throughout the state. So that's, that's important. And again, like I said, the waivers for the foods may, well, they will eventually expire, the expanded food list. So um, that will be a change to readjust to. Uh, the one good thing to know is that we do continue to offer those follow-up appointments, um, the options to do a phone appointment or an online nutrition lesson. So those will continue. It just won't be the same or it won't be every appointment will be a phone appointment option um, once we return to normal. So what should child care providers know about WIC? Um, I think basically who would be eligible and that if you think a family could benefit from WIC that you're referring appropriately um, and providing them the correct information. So again, just making sure the family has a child under five in the household. Um, that's pretty much all you need to know. Um, and that maybe they participate in Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, or another, you know, the FDA PIR program, or maybe maybe they have a lower income. So uh, who's eligible? Our basic services, you know, the free food, the nutrition education, breastfeeding support, and referrals to other services. And then um, one important thing to know is they can definitely participate in SNAP and WIC at the same time. They're two separate programs. And how to connect families with WIC. So that's probably the most important thing. Um, there's multiple ways to connect families with WIC. Like I mentioned, we have our online referral form. The website's right there, it's super short. You could provide this information to the family and they could self-refer or you could submit a referral on behalf of the family with their consent. You could also help them find a clinic or just provide the clinic information linked to the family. And we also have the food resource hotline, which is operated by Hunger Free Colorado. And they can connect the family with WIC, they can help them apply for SNAP if they're interested and hook them up with other resources in the community, um, such as food banks and, and other programs. So that's a great number to know. 
And if you'd actually like to provide something in written material form to the family and you have a printer, you could definitely download our What is WIC flyer, which is available in six languages. And that's um, hyperlinked right here in the presentation, but also on the PDF you'll be receiving. And let's see, the Blueprint to Color, oh, sorry, the Blueprint to End Hunger created a food resources flyer specifically um, for COVID, but it's a pretty comprehensive flyer that has information on SNAP, WIC, and then um, programs that are providing free meals for children and older adults. So that's a nice flyer to share as well. And then you could also just simply refer the families to our website, coloradowick.com, and um, they can find out all the information they need there as well. They can hyperlink to our online referral form from our website. They can uh, find out if they're eligible by reading a little bit more about that. So it's a great resource if you don't have ability to uh, print. And I think that's it, but I just um, want to again, thank you guys all for taking time to uh, meet with us today and learn a little bit more about our programs. And also thank you guys for everything that you do for families because that's huge. We really appreciate you. So I'm open to questions or comments. Um, yeah, I actually, mm -hmm. I, I had a few uh, pop up just while I was going through that that I was curious uh, on. Okay. So one was uh, in relation to childcare providers um, referring to. Uh -huh. um, so you mentioned uh, when you said it first time, verbal consent, they don't need any kind of written consent. It's fine to just be verbal. Yeah, I can show you really quick on our referral form if it plays nice with me. <laughs> um, we do have a we do have a little box here. It says by completion and signing of this form indicates that consent has been obtained from the party named above. So basically from the family for this referral and to con and for contact to be made using the information provided. Okay. So that's basically the consent piece. Awesome. Um, I, I was also a little curious slash confused um, mm -hmm. just on, uh, so it varies from WIC clinic to WIC clinic, um, but if those extensions that you mentioned are approved for September, is that approved for all WIC clinics or just? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it's a little confusing. So um, I work for the Colorado WIC program at the state, and then we have local agency WIC programs. We have 37 throughout the state. And each local agency might have more than one clinic. So Tri-County, the Tri-County WIC clinic has 11, or the Tri-County agency has 11 clinics. Um, so all together we have 37 agencies, but some of them have multiple clinics. And so we have over a hundred clinics. Um, but the agency has to follow the guidelines provided by their local public health department, if that's who they're affiliated with, or with the federally qualified health center, if that's who they're affiliated with. So we can provide guidance in terms of reopening. Um, and of course, that guidance would be aligning with what is provided at the state uh, through Gover Governor Polis's office. But, you know, if the local public health agency decides to reopen, then the WIC agency or WIC clinic within the HC may need to also start to reopen their doors. Um, but the waivers that we do apply for are statewide and they are seeking an extension for, you know, a national waiver. So every state would have the ability if they have already been approved for a waiver to extend them through September. Um, but some agencies still may be opening up their doors. Um, but if the waiver is extended, we, they would still have the ability to provide services by phone, even though they may end up starting to see people in the clinic too. It just gives them the option to maybe do both, depending on what their agency is asking of them. Does that make sense? It's a little confusing, I know. Yeah, no, it is, it is a little confusing, but you did perfect. <laughs> that cleared yeah. it up for me, thank you. Um, yeah, it's funny. This is actually like the fourth time this week I've heard about WIC because my uh, wife's a social worker and she presents on it all the time. Oh, well, nice. <laughs> so, I hear it from the, the child care side. Um, mm -hmm. So a question just came in. Uh, can women who do not qualify for WIC participate in breastfeeding support? Um, actually, that's a great question. So not necessarily as a participant, because a participant in WIC or a client in WIC is receiving a food package and direct, you know, service, you know, nutrition education. 
but we do have a lot of um, breastfeeding support groups throughout the state that WIC manages that are in the community. So anybody is welcome to join. So um, I would just say, depending on where you live, connecting with the local WIC agency in your area to see what type of breastfeeding support groups they might run that community members could join if they're not um, in the actual program. Awesome. And do most of the WIC clinics tend to have a, a website or something like that where you can glean information or typically do you need to call? Um, no, I would actually go to their website. So most of them are affiliated with a local public health agency, but you don't have to worry about that. I would just go to, you probably just go to our website, the Find WIC Clinic and locate the closest one. And then um, it provides all the information about the clinic. So you can you know, go from there. It won't link directly to their website, I believe, um, but it'll tell you who, who their uh, agency is. And so I would say that's probably a great way to start. Awesome. Versus calling. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, finally, um, so you mentioned that, you know, we're waiting on the extensions. Where, where can uh, our attendees find the information if it is uh, accepted? That is also a great idea or a great question. Um, so on our website, we'll just pull it up really quick if it'll be nice. Can you see our website? Did it just pull up? This time we didn't bounce with you. And I, I'm assuming it's just because of the PowerPoint. Um, let's see, you don't see it? Now I do, yep, we're there. Oh, now. you do? Okay, awesome. Um, so this is our website and this is our landing page. And we have a family alert, the COVID with COVID-19 info. So if you just open that, it's gonna tell you what's happening. <laughs> um, this will be a basic snapshot. And like we're saying, contact the clinic that you typically go to or are interested in just to find out how services are being provided. It's probably the best way to go. Uh, we are creating an FAQ that um, I think will be really helpful as we transition, especially if it varies throughout the state. So that should be available in a little bit. But we also have you know, some other information you know, through this link. Um, but I think really the landing page is the best spot, spot to go. Awesome. Uh, right here. Yeah, and it'll just be front and center. And I think the final question I have actually just comes from uh, those presentations that I've been uh, sitting on with my wife's is uh, related to the WIC app. Um, would you mind mm -hmm. just sharing a little bit more information about what can be found in that app? Yeah, the WIC Shopper app is, it's awesome. Everybody's really liked it since we rolled it out. So um, there'll be push notifications. So that's a great way to stay up to date with what's happening with WIC, especially during COVID. So participants can receive information that way. Um, it, you can scan items that you're like, I don't know if this is a WIC food item or not. Sometimes it's questionable. Um, and again, the food list is really awesome, but it's really long. And so you don't want to be thumbing through a food list sometimes at the grocery store. So you could just scan the item to find out if it's WIC approved. Um, and then you just have to make sure that it's part of your food package. You haven't used all, you know, that whole food category. You know, if you still have cereal left and it says it's WIC approved, you just have to make sure you, you know, you still have cereal left on your food package in order to purchase it. Um, so it has that, it has the food benefits, like I said, for the month, uh, how much food you have on your package in different categories. And that's really important too. Before people would have to keep receipts. So you don't have to do that anymore. Um, I think they can access nutrition, or I think, I know, they can access um, wichealth.org, which is our online nutrition lesson uh, program so they can learn more about foods there and recipes how to cook with different WIC foods and yeah all sorts of stuff wonderful awesome all right well you know I'm gonna it doesn't look like we've had any uh, last minute questions pop in I'm going to just keep it open for another 15 30 seconds just in case anybody does have anything uh, that they still have questions on um, sure. but I wanted to thank you so much Aaron for um, sure for sitting with us today. And um, if people do have questions, are they free to email you as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can reach out to me directly. Um, and I would encourage you to check the website out too, because that might answer some of your questions. Um, oh, and also one other thing to note is our What is WIC flyer will be updated fairly soon. Um, the one I mentioned, you can download from the website. So in the next few weeks. So if you're interested in printing it for families, I'd say hold off on printing too many because 
it'll look slightly different in the next few weeks. Um, new and improved. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you right. so much, Aaron, and thank you, Chrissy okay. and Lisa, for speaking on the CACFP as well. Um, to everybody else, we are going to be uh, sending out the post-webinar messaging um, as soon as this recording is complete. It usually takes about 30 minutes after we uh, close out of the meeting. Um, so yeah, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Lisa, Chrissy, and Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Yeah. Bye, guys. All right. And I'll see you all next week. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye.